So tonight we're going to start off with Kip Coddington. Kip is going to be investigating why carbon capture is important for Wyoming's economic future, a climate policy overview. Kip is a chemical engineer and a lawyer. He is the director of energy policy and economics at UW School of Energy Resources. He's an international expert in the application of technology, law, and climate policy to, do, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels. Before moving to Wyoming, Kip, where have you been here about five years, four years? Um, before moving to Wyoming, he practiced law for several major law firms where he advised both re, on both renewable and fossil, both renewable and fossil energy companies. He is the co-founder of the North American Carbon Capture and Storage Association. I could say more, he's practiced law in London. We're so pleased that he decided to move to Laramie, so yeah. please help me welcome <laughs> Kip. So, Gene, thank you for that uh, very gracious introduction. My name is Kip, and as Gene said, I am the Director of Energy Policy and Economics at the School of Energy Resources, and I have literally spent my entire life doing carbon capture and storage. And I spent the bulk of that, my career in DC as a lawyer, advising projects, writing policy papers, working with Congress and the like. Uh, but I got tired of that a few years ago, and I really wanted to do real projects. I wanted to be involved in putting steel in the ground. And, and it, it was not too difficult of an analysis to conclude that if, if this technology was going to take off, it was going to take off here in Wyoming. And that's why I'm here. Um, so my, my role on this panel is to explain briefly why the University of Wyoming is engaged in this technology called carbon capture and storage to begin with. So I'm going to provide the, the policy framework. I'm going to talk a little bit about how coal emissions are currently regulated. I'm going to dabble in a little bit of, of climate science. And all this is by way of setting the stage for why we are here, why we are seeking the input and guidance and feedback from the community of Gillette and the coal industry and the natural gas industry um, before we in, embark in this, in this science. Because obviously the University of Wyoming is a, is a land grant institution. We are a public institution. We are all taxpayers. Um, through the Department of Energy, we are spending your tax dollars. We are spending our, our tax dollars. We feel that uh, public mission uh, deeply every day. So this is an example of a project that is just not science for the sake of science, not that there's anything wrong with that, but this is a project that has a very applied focus in a policy-relevant framework, and that's what I hope to deliver to you today. So I'm going to begin with just a big overview of Wyoming energy, and obviously I'm sitting here in the energy capital of the world, so it takes, it takes a fair amount of uh, arrogance, I suppose, to, to come to Gillette and talk to you about a Wyoming energy overview, but I'm going to start with that. Then I'm going to dabble in a brief a primer on climate science, and then I'm going to explain why climate science really doesn't matter uh, for purposes of this project, because these policy obligations are baked into the cake. This, is, this project is about the advancement of technologies to meet existing law that applies to coal-fired power plants. And that will be my third topic. I'm going to put on my legal code again and talk a little bit about if you are owning and operating a coal-fired power plant, what your current obligations are today to reduce your emissions of greenhouse gases regardless of whether you think the glaciers are advancing or retreating. Uh, so uh, we're going to take you down for a couple minutes to the College of Law at the University of Wyoming, and this is going to be a uh, course on, on legal obligations with respect to coal. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what uh, energy experts forecast for future markets for energy, both internationally in the United States and what that means for Wyoming. And then uh, as a teaser or a lead-in or introduction to the technical experts that will, that will follow, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about more about what is this technology called carbon capture and storage, which is ultimately what this project is about. Uh, 
So let me begin with a Wyoming energy overview. And uh, you, know, you don't have to read the slides. I'm going to boil it down to you right here. Wyoming is, of course, the energy capital of the world. We're blessed with significant amounts of fossil fuels, also renewable energy. But what is important for us and for the remainder of this talk is that we export nearly all of it. So uh, these are official figures from the U.S. Department of Energy identifying by state the top states that are uh, top net energy suppliers. And Wyoming is number one. Um, and of course, you all knew, th knew that. We particularly dominate with respect to coal. And here a busy slide for which I apologize, but Wyoming coal from the Powder River Basin in particular is sent to tens of states throughout the United States. And nearly all of our natural gas is, is exported. And that is for a couple different reasons. Number one, we have a lot of those fuels. And number two, there are not a lot of us. <laughs> you know, you could not, we could not possibly consume all the energy that was produced without bringing more people to the state. So what does this mean? This means our energy future to a great extent is dictated by decisions and consumer preferences that are somewhat outside of our control. So we, we don't, ha we have very little control within our own borders over the future of coal, for example. Instead, we are largely dependent upon what those coal-fired utilities in those other 30 states, how they view coal, how those state governments view coal, how policymakers around the world view coal. And of course, you already know this already. So with respect to coal exports, we are not sitting on a port here in Wyoming. We are dependent upon litigation, policy changes, what have you, in order to build uh, coal export terminals over which we have very little control as a state. Um, so uh, again, I'm going to be talking a little bit now about climate policy and some of you may be saying, well, climate policy isn't relevant for Wyoming. It is whether you like it or not and whether the glaciers are advancing or retreating. We are subject to these views because these are the positions held by a lot of people that are consumers and customers of Wyoming Energy, most of whom don't live in this state. Um, now I'm going to pivot to a brief uh, primer on climate science. And they always say, as a public speaker, the first thing they tell you is never begin with an apology or, or an excuse. But I'm going to begin with an excuse here. I am not an atmospheric scientist. I am not a climate scientist. Um, we have those creatures down in Laramie and certainly at, at, at sister universities, and we would be more than happy to bring, to bring them up here as well. So I am not purporting to, to tell you my own personal views about this, but I can read. Uh, so I'm going to tell you the prevailing views on climate science, but with an important footnote. For better or for worse, climate science really doesn't matter when it comes to the greenhouse gas emission requirements that are impacting coal-fired power plants, because those requirements are already the law. Well, so what I'm going to be talking about after the, the climate science is what the law is. But you need to understand, so we're going to talk about climate science, but people that are regulating coal-fired power plants really are no longer talking about the science. They are talking about what technologies are we going to develop and apply to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from these facilities in compliance with current law. But, so this project is all premised on the greenhouse effect. Um, you've probably all heard of the greenhouse effect. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide. This is, this is largely what the greenhouse effect is and, 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 and how it works. There are these gases collectively called greenhouse gases. These greenhouse gases are, uh, there are several different forces, uh, several different sources of them. There are two that are primarily relevant for Wyoming and fossil fuels. One is carbon dioxide, and everyone here knows this. Carbon dioxide, when you burn a fossil fuel, 
coal or natural gas, you create carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a long-lived greenhouse gas. It has a residence time of decades in the atmosphere. So it, it goes in the atmosphere and it has the propensity to trap um, inbound radiation that has reflected off the surface of the Earth and then is, is trying to exit. So carbon dioxide is ultimately the gas this project is talking about. Um, if, if it is funded in future phases, we will be endeavoring to capture and store carbon dioxide, but that's what carbon dioxide is. Of course, the other major greenhouse gas that's relevant for Wyoming is methane. Methane, of course, is natural gas. So natural gas, by its mere existence, is a greenhouse gas. Um, natural gas is a more potent greenhouse gas, but it has a shorter residence time in the in the atmosphere. So all greenhouse gases are not created equally. Carbon dioxide is created when you combust any fossil fuel, and this project is ultimately about mitigating potentially CO2 emissions from the combustion of all fossil fuels, in particularly here coal-fired um, electricity generation at, at Dry Fork Station. Um, now just a brief, the second slide here on, uh, on uh, the state of the science, and then I'm going to stop. So a lot of climate science is based upon sophisticated, forward-looking modeling. There are these models called integrated assessment models. Uh, again, you could take an entire course on these uh, down at the University of Wyoming. A lot of this, though, is, again, basic hard science. So you can go with a monitor, and you can hold it up in the air, and you can measure the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That is just basic science 101. And the, one of the official sensors for that is at the top of this volcano in, in Hawaii. And for decades, they have been measuring daily what the concentration in parts per million of CO2 is. Um, and they can take it all the way back through time. This will be relevant later because you'll see from this slide that it goes back to 1750. Now, I am pretty certain, I'm not a history major, but I don't think George Washington was out there taking measurements of CO2, right? So before a certain period of time, really smart scientists can go back and use proxies for what the atmospheric concentrations of CO2 were over historical records. If you go back far enough, they're looking at ice cores. If you go back in more recent centuries, they can do a lot of solid science looking at tree rings, for example. But in recent decades, with the advancement of sensor technology, you can go stand on top of a volcano and you can measure it today. And that concentration is uniform worldwide. That isn't a, a point at Hawaii. That it's, so it's, as of last Friday, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is 4.12 parts per million. And you can see that has been that has been going up. And why that is also relevant is that if you're an, an atmospheric scientist and you're focused on climate policy, the part per million number everyone is focused on is 450 parts per million. And th the current international goal is to try to not exceed 450 parts per million. And you can see we're sort of climbing up towards that. And the current estimate is that, well, if we stay on the current trajectory, we could hit 450 parts per million by 2035, 2040. But this number matters. If you're doing climate policy, everyone is focused on as that number climbs up to, to 450 parts per million. And I'll explain why um, next. So now I want to pivot, and I've got my phone up here, not because I'm rudely reading emails while I'm doing this talk. I'm actually being respectful, Gene, and not going to uh, exceed my, my time limit. I'm now going to talk a lot about climate law and policy, and this is, quite frankly, the bulk of my talk. And this is why the University of, Research, uh, University of Wyoming is in your community uh, hopefully with your consent to try to work on these technologies, to try to identify mitigation pathways, ultimately with a legal underpinning. So what is the status of uh, current climate law and policy? 
Well, this is it. So now I'm putting on my UW College of, of Law class, and all of you are first year law students, and this is what you need to know. In 2007, the US Supreme Court, the highest legal authority in the, in the land, said that greenhouse gases were pollutants, and they said that as a result, they are subject to regulation under the Clean Air Act. And that if, if I stop talking now, that is, that is why we are here. So for the past 12 years, it has been the law of the land that greenhouse gases collectively and individually, including carbon dioxide, which you produce in abundance when you burn coal and also when you produce natural gas, um, are pollutants, and we're in a community where we view CO2 as a commodity, right? I mean, I, I used to do a lot of deals with CO2 enhanced oil recovery companies. In, in, the, in the oil patch, CO2 is a commodity. If I'm Denbury, I'll pay you for your CO2. And those, those prices, those contracts, those offtake contracts have purchase prices in them. But under federal law, CO2 is a pollutant. And since that time, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has been regulating those pollutants. And so that's kind of it. And that's why we are, that's why we are here. If you are building, a, building and operating a coal-fired plant today, you are subject to greenhouse gas emission requirements. And that's really all you need to take away from my part of the talk. And that's why this research is so important. We are working on a mitigation technology called carbon capture and storage that we hope current and future fossil fuel using facilities, particularly those using coal, can use now to comply with the law. This isn't just esoteric research because we're just interested in trying to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, and, and a lot of us are interested and worried about the climate. And yes, we are doing this because we care about the glaciers. But the real reason we are doing this is because it is the law. It is the law to reduce your emissions of greenhouse gases. And that also is, is for cars, by the way. I mean, for those of you, you know, drive, I always use this example, you know, driving on 180, you know, over the Laramie Mountain from Cheyenne to Laramie, you know, you see those trucks and they all have those fairings. Did you ever wonder why 18 wheelers have those fans, those fairings underneath the, um, the trailer? Um, why now in the back they've got those four little door-like things that come, come in? Does anyone know why trucks have those? Excuse me? Correct, and that is because that is required under federal law. So every time you pass an 18-wheeler um, and you see all those aerodynamic structures on it, that is a mandate from federal law to reduce that truck's combustion of diesel fuel so you can reduce the CO2 coming out the tailpipe. So that's kind of what we're doing we hope to be doing for Dry Fork Station. We're hoping to put, at some point, subject to a lot of contingencies down the road, fairings on that plant to reduce its emissions of CO2. And we're doing it because that is, the, that is what federal law says. But let's say, and by the way, you know, so I, I give this talk a lot and people say, well, there's a new government in Washington, D.C. And yes, there is, and a lot of these rules took place under the prior administration. But the Trump administration is implementing these regulations as well. What the Trump administration has proposed to do is to modify these standards a little bit, but the Trump administration has not fundamentally changed the posture of the federal government that greenhouse gas emissions are required to be regulated and, and will be regulated. So this is not this is not currently, this edifice is not being dismantled in Washington, D.C. It's being tweaked, but its foundation is there.
and is, and, is, and is unlikely to ever change. But let's say you say, well, okay, I actually think, you know, the, the, the federal government that the Supreme Court case will be challenged and, and maybe all this is going to go away. Let's assume, let's assume the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency goes out of business tomorrow. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but let's say, let's say you're holding out that possibility. These climate policies are also baked into s separately into state laws. So here are, just going quickly, the first block shows states with greenhouse gas emission standards for power plants, which would be coal and, and natural gas. The next slide shows states with greenhouse gas emission targets. Then you've got the states with so-called renewable and or clean energy portfolio standards. In these states, which is the bulk of the United States, if you're a, uh, if you're a utility, you are subject to a requirement that requires you to utilize a mixture of fuels, including renewable fuels and, in some instances, clean energy fuels. And by the way, this, this technology we're talking about, these uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, in at least one state, Illinois, for example, uh, carbon capture and storage, we think, would qualify as a, as a part of that clean energy portfolio requirement. So not only is this technology we're working on today relevant for federal law, we're hoping that it will be adopted and ultimately be in compliant with um, states that have already adopted these um, portfolio standards with more to come. Um, then you've got the, the bottom slide shows states with so-called decoupling policies. This is a form of, of energy efficiency in these states, uh, for example, and we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, Chairwoman uh, Fornstrom of the Wyoming Public Service Commission here today, so I'm hopefully I'm not, I am not a utility lawyer, so hopefully I'm not embarrassing myself too much here, but these are the states effectively that have decoupled uh, on, the, on, the, on, on the pricing side, the, the revenue model for utilities typically was based upon energy consumption and building, building projects. There you would get a return on capital, you get some return on the energy you're producing. These states have tried to break that link, decouple that link, and come up with compensation models for utilities um, that, is, that is moving away from that. Have I, hopefully I haven't botched that, <laughs> hopefully that's close enough, okay. Um, then you have other states that have uh, climate-related policies, and of course in Wyoming, Wyoming, if you, if you walk outside and look to the west, you are gazing upon California that has the most aggressive climate policies in, in the United States, as you all know, and there are, there are power plants in Wyoming that sell electricity into those, into those markets today. So those states in California, for example, and on the East Coast, they are well along the way towards taking a hard look at coal-fired electricity and saying, you know, in future years, do we want to continue to have coal-fired electricity allowed to be used in our states? And that's also why we're working on, on, on this technology, because we think this, this technology, if ultimately deployed commercially, will, will enable the export, if you will, from Wyoming of, of low carbon electricity. We also think it will apply for transportation fuels, so uh, there's a lot of oil produced in Wyoming. One, California, this is a, a slide showing low carbon fuel standards, California and other states have a requirement that the carbon content of transportation fuels is reduced. So I, I can't go into California today with a barrel of oil and sell it. I can't do that. I have to go through a complicated methodology to show that is a low carbon barrel. Now that, that glosses over a lot of complexity, but that's basically it. And that's another thing that another technology, another pathway we think this is technology is, is helpful for in that earlier this year, California said if you're doing carbon capture and storage, you're generating green oil. Now they don't call it green oil, but this technology, even though it's being looked at at Dry Fork Station, it ultimately has potential benefits for the oil industry here as well that may be injecting that CO2, storing it as part of the process, and then generating a low carbon barrel that then can be sold in California and, and, and other states. Um, 
But let's step out and look broadly. You know, I, I began this talk by talking a little bit about, um, you know, coal exports. So Wyoming wants to export a lot of coal. Um, you know, companies doing business in Wyoming, you know, have, have an international footprint. So we are also influenced by international law with respect to climate policy. So just briefly, everything I've been talking about now has been international law for literally decades. So uh, you've all heard of the Kyoto Protocol. I'm going to talk a little bit about, so, so I hear people say, oh, well, the United States isn't a party to the Kyoto Protocol, and that's true. But we are a party to the foundational agreement back in 1992 called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And that, that I've highlighted in red what that treaty's goal is. It is the, um, the objective is the stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations, that's that 412 part per million, in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anth anthropogenic, that means human-made, interference with the climate system. The U.S. signed that decades ago. Now, it's not enforceable, but in 1992, the U.S. government signed up to that. So this has been baked into the cake for a long time. None of this is, is new. You in the Q&A, I can sort of explain you know, how they define what dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate is. It, largely, what it is, is, is interpreted as, as I said before, if, if you exceed 450 parts per million of CO2 by 2050, then that is an unfortunate day. That's what, you know, a cohort of climate scientists would say. And that's what people are trying to, tying, uh, you know, trying to halt. Um, now, that, that convention has been implemented, you know, through more specific treaties over time. You know, there was the Kyoto Protocol. I'm not going to talk about that. I want to talk a little bit about the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is a major new international climate treaty that takes effect uh, in 2021. The U.S. is currently a party to it. The Obama administration committed us to it. The Trump administration has committed us to, to withdrawal. It's about a, it's, it's a four-year withdrawal process. But again, it's, this won't impact the Supreme Court decision in, in, in 2007. It doesn't really impact federal law. Um, but it is this broad, broad overhang. So if you're a coal exporter, you're going to be influenced by customers abroad that are, that are looking at, at the Paris Agreement. And indeed, just two, two days ago, the major coal company Glenrock, based in Australia, said that they were capping their production of coal because of the Paris Agreement. So most major companies, uh, including energy companies, all the majors, the oil and gas companies, they are all doing business modeling based upon the Paris Agreement, which again takes effect in a, in a couple years and is trying to drive down these part per million numbers in the, in the atmosphere. Again, in Q&A, I'd be happy to talk more about the climate, uh, the Paris Agreement, if you're interested. And I want to try to, in my, in my last remaining moments here, talk a little bit about what the, what the energy forecasts are. And I have to begin with a caveat. So anytime anyone, myself included, is saying anything about the future, the first thing you need to do is hold on to your wallet. Because obviously, if I could tell the future, I would be in Las Vegas tonight, right? So. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what experts say for future energy markets and take it all with a grain, grain of salt. These are not predictions. These are just sort of best, best forecasts by really smart energy modelers that are doing their best applying technology, economics, and policy and trying to, trying to draw that, that line out. But again, these are not forecasts. I'm relentlessly optimistic about, about the future. So, you know, anytime someone talks to me about something about coal, I say, well, that's right, and you're probably right, but, you know, they're probably guilty of straight line future forecasting, and I'm a great believer in, in technological progress and the like. But, but what do these, so, you know, briefly, what does the future look like for energy? So, there is, in fact, a energy transition going on. And that sounds threatening, right? An energy transition, I'm doing something, you know, I would never want the legal 
you know, the legal field to transition because <laughs> then it sounds like I'm going to have to have to find something else to do. But there is this so-called energy transition underway. But but I'm not sure that's all that remarkable in and, in and of itself because everything is always changing, right? I mean, there's always been an energy tr transition uh, from from the types of fuels that, that that have been used and the like. But but there is an energy tr transition going on, and roughly, this is it. Renewable energy sources are getting uh, better, improving in terms of technology, and their costs are coming down. Um, and of course, renewable energy sources generally don't have greenhouse gas emissions, so they sort of get a pass on all this stuff. Fossil fuels, their costs are challenged, and they are subject to greenhouse gas emission requirements. Um, and that's that's kind of it. Every, every year, renewables in, in electricity markets generally are increasing their, their penetration. Um, we all know they're intermittent, uh, but gr grid-scale energy storage technologies um, are also being advanced. And again, we can talk more, more about this on, on Q&A. In terms of transportation fuels, by the way, uh, you know, the, the popular transportation fuel of the day is electricity. You know, it looks like electric vehicles have staying power. And there's a handful of countries in Europe, if you can believe it or not, that have enacted bans on the internal combustion engine. Uh, five or six countries that by between 2025, 2030, and 2035, you will no longer be able to sell an internal combustion engine vehicle in, in those markets, which is, which is pretty stunning. And they're going to replace it with, with electricity. Now, to me, I think that's pretty interesting for coal because that's a potential new, that's kind, of a, that's kind of a utility replacing an oil and gas company, right? So maybe the future is bright for electricity. You just need to have electricity with a lower carbon footprint. So that's why this project also has potential application with respect to, to future vehicles as well. Now, just a brief note about uh, cost, and I see I'm coming up here almost on my, my time limit here, Gene. This is a very busy chart. All you need to see, the, the top of it shows uh, the current, it's called, the, the metric is levelized cost of energy, and that's effectively a net present value of unit energy cost to generate a particular type of, of energy. You might think of it as the, the clearing price as a producer of this, uh, a, a user of this fuel in order to make money on a project. The top shows a variety of renewable energies, the bottom shows a, a variety of um, conventional energies. If you'll excuse me for the uh, folks that are viewing, I'm gonna tip away from the mic here. So this is, this is coal, and if you could just visually go up and see coal's current metrics are already now somewhat being covered by renewable energy. And indeed, if you look at wind, wind, and, and this is a non-subsidized, so, so this is not looking at wind energy tax credits. So subject to assumptions, wind in some markets is already cheaper to operate, if you will, from a coal-fired power plant. And, and, and this is another challenge for coal beyond, the, um, beyond climate policy. But I, but I didn't want to leave you with a with the, with, the, with the belief that, you know, the only challenge facing coal is climate policy. Obviously, there's a lot of basic economics at play here as well. I'm going to skip that slide. Briefly turning to carbon capture and storage, and then, Scott, I think you're next. So this project briefly is about carbon capture and storage. Um, you'll sometimes hear the acronym carbon capture, utilization, and storage, and it is just what it sounds like. You have a coal-fired power plant or any fossil-fueled fire facility, it's producing CO2. You capture the CO2, compress it, put it in a pipeline, and then you either store it underground or you utilize it in products. Um, and indeed, going on here at the Integrated Test Center, that's also what they're looking at with, with, with the Carbon X Prize and the like. But this is what this, this technology is all about. Um, you need to know that there's actually this, this technology, even though we're still in doing research on it, it is largely uh, understood to be needed. Um, and it, again, this, this technology is also 
baked into, into federal law. So I mentioned how the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is already regulating greenhouse gas emissions. U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has said that a coal-fired power plant can use this technology to comply with the Clean Air Act. And indeed, it, you can use CO2 for enhanced oil recovery and also comply with the Clean Air Act. So even though th there are not a lot of these facilities up and operating worldwide, the lawyers and regulators have already said, if you can get this up and, up and, up and going, it's good. This is legally, legally acceptable. And of course, uh, we're fortunate to have the, the U.S. Department of Energy as a, as a major funder. Um, Senator Barrasso, Senator Enzi, um, you know, the Wyoming federal delegation, they are in Washington every day, Representative Cheney, sort of fighting for uh, tax incentives that had helped to advance and support these technologies. And, and we can talk a little bit more about what's, what some of those tax incentives are. You also need to know that this is a very heavily regulated field. So this is, um, there have been regulations in place, both at the federal level and the state level, that manage all aspects of this process. The capture process is regulated. CO2 pipelines have been in existence for decades. They're also regulated and have a tremendous safety record. And the subsurface storage piece is also extensively regulated. I'm talking extensive regulations here. So that's why when this project goes, goes forward, if it goes forward in future grant rounds, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency isn't going to be behind us taking notes saying, hey, okay, well, are you, are you, what are you doing here? What are you going to be doing there? We're going to be following extensive regulations that have already been issued by the federal government in order to ensure uh, the safety of human, uh, you know, hu humans, animals, and subsurface attributes. Uh, and again, we can talk more about this in, um, in Q&A. I just want to close here with, and, and this actually, this slide is probably the reason why I moved from Washington, D.C. to Wyoming. And this is, Wyoming is a wonderfully progressive, can-do state. Wyoming is a state where conservationists, environmentalists, and people that want to work on projects uh, to advance natural resources in an environmentally conscious way can come together. And there's no better example than this than the Wyoming legislature a decade ago, which enacted these suites of laws. So Wyoming has passed a, a whole suite of laws governing this technology, carbon capture and storage. And indeed, Wyoming is one of the only states in the nation that has done so. So we'll be hearing from Scott and Fred in a little bit about, well, you're going to be storing CO2 underground if this project were to advance, but who, who has ownership of that CO2? Who's responsible for it? Well, Wyoming answered that a decade ago. And they said w is that if you own the surface, if you're a rancher and you own the surface on fee land, private land, you own the pores. You own the storage rights. They also said if you're injecting CO2, you're responsible for it. Um, and again, this is wonderfully advanced thinking of the Wyoming legislature setting the rules in advance uh, before projects would begin. So we now know what, what the rules of the, of the road are. Um, is it safe? Does it work? You know, I'll talk about this in Q&A. There are other projects like this out there. And I just wanted to end here. I'm almost, I'm almost out, of, out of time. I also want to close with this thought. And that is that, um, you know, I, I'm incredibly optimistic about carbon capture and storage. L literally, it's the reason why, why I moved to Wyoming. But I'm also not here to oversell it or, or make over, over commitments. I mean, this is a difficult technology. It is costly. And it is competing with you know, other, other energy sources. So I don't want you to come away from my talk with the thought, uh, with the opposite conclusion that, well, the, wow, this is, you know, we're on the cusp of all these projects and there's gonna be carbon capture and storage projects everywhere. It's more complicated than that. There's hardcore economics involved. Energy investors have a suite of technologies in which to invest. 
and this technology is competing in that, in that space. Um, so, so don't come away, uh, away with the impression that this may potentially solve all of, all of coal's problems. I think it's a tool in the toolkit and one that needs to be advanced, but it is, it is not, a, not a panacea. And I think with that, I am going to stop talking, Gene. So, yes, can I be happy to take one question? Yes, sir. Yes. What's the sweet spot for CO2? It, it, does it, in the models, does it exist? If it's 100 pounds of emissions, are they going to capture 50 pounds? What's, is there a number? Uh, that's a great question. So I can tell you what the regulatory standard is. And again, so this is the regulatory standard that is currently being revised by the Trump administration. The Obama administration number was expressed in pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. So if you were to build a new coal-fired power plant, its CO2 emission rate was 1,400 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. So you'd have to do math to, to say what's, how big is that unit, how much power is it going to be generating, and then from that you could back out what the capture rate would have to, would, would have to be. Um, so it, there is no magic. I can't tell you it's 90%, 85%, 40%. That number may vary. The current federal law is based in terms, again, of an emission rate on pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. You'd have to back calculate that into, based upon the size of the unit into what the, but I, but I actually think there's great confidence. And again, the CO2 capture in many industries is, is an old, mature technology. They've been doing this in the chemical industry for a, for a long time. They're separating it down at Chute Creek, you know, for natural gas separation plants. It's a little more complicated when this, the stream is dilute as it is from a coal-fired power plant. But there's even technologies today, amine base, that are being used. And the Department of Energy is funding a lot of projects to drive those cost, those cost numbers down. Um, but it's, yeah, that, the cost of capture is, is, is coming, uh, the cost of capture is coming down and those technologies are coming on, you know, fast. Are they coming on fast enough? We can debate that. <laughs>